Welcome to module 16. Um, today our topic is assets and I'm going to start on a little bit different page here today. This is from the FDIC website where you can look up any bank and right here I've looked up Abacus Federal Savings Bank. This is a small bank. I think it's a good example of a very traditional bank. Um, it also is the bank that is the subject of the movie Small Enough to Jail, a movie about uh, the financial crisis that I would recommend. But anyway, over the next few modules, we'll be looking at different items on a bank's balance sheet. And particularly this module is assets, and then we'll be looking at liabilities, and then we will look at capital. And so all of this information is publicly available. You could look up any bank that you want. Um, but what I want to focus on here is here when we look at assets, this very traditional bank, which is what Abacus Bank, a small bank is, its biggest asset by far are loans. And that is the way a bank traditionally operates, that their biggest asset will be loans. And as a very small bank, there's not many other assets that they have here. They have um, some premises. There's limitations on real estate ownings by bank. They have some cash and balances at other depository institutions, very small amount of securities, but most of their assets are in loans. And for that reason, we are going to be talking about the loans. And that will be the focus of our discussion of assets. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and we're going to go back to sharing the PowerPoint here. Um, and so what we see is that just like bank activities are restricted, bank investments are restricted. And one of the restrictions is the restriction on loans to one borrower and loans to insiders. And one of the goals of these restrictions is to encourage banks to diversify and to, again, prop them up, not for the benefit of the bank or the bank's investors, but for the benefit of those um, who have their money in the bank and really the whole overall banking system. But anytime we have a restriction, and particularly a very black letter line restriction, it creates a real compliance um, task for those in compliance. And so looking first at loans to one borrower, what we see is that the total loans and extensions of credit, and again, we're focusing on national banks, but there will be similar restrictions for all state banks, cannot exceed 15% of the bank's unimpaired capital and unimpaired surplus. And as we'll talk about, that's essentially its best type of capital. Um, and then there's an additional 10% permitted if they are this additional 10% of loans or extensions of credit are fully secured by readily marketable collateral. So these are very specific requirements and they are tied to items that can change. The capital can change and the security can also change the value of security. So this tells you that it's constant monitoring. Um, there are some exceptions to these limits, and those are loans or extensions of credit secured by any type of sort of U.S. government treasury bills or bonds or notes or loans that are secured by an actual deposit account or other loans approved by the comptroller. So essentially, if you make a loan and the entity you make the loan to can secure it essentially with cash or something that's cash equivalent, then those limitations will not apply. And as I said, loans or extensions of credit um, is broadly defined and has been expanded um, during the Dodd-Frank Act changes to include not what we would traditionally think of as loans and extensions of credit, but also to include other types of contractual arrangements that were very popular such as derivative transactions and other types of contractual arrangements, which really obligate the bank. Um, and so just to give you a sense, because this is something that we see throughout banking law, prior to the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, banking law was very much based on traditional assets and liabilities, 
But what happened was we saw um, during the financial crisis that a lot of the problems weren't from traditional assets and liabilities, but from these contractual arrangements. So I have put up a little diagram. I think diagrams can be helpful to explain how a derivative transaction is very much like a loan, except that it's a contractual arrangement where a lender and a borrower and a counterparty, a third party, enter into different contracts where they sort of bet against what will be a fixed rate pre-agreed upon versus a variable rate, which will change with the market. Um, and essentially, each party takes a different position and they net out what each other owes. And it is something that banks were doing much more frequently prior to the financial crisis and they continue to do today. And it can be an appropriate way for banks to, as they say, hedge the situation. But what's important from our standpoint is to understand that some of these non-traditional contractual arrangements are now considered loans or extensions of credit for purposes of the loans to one borrower rule. Um, readily market of collateral, which allows um, a bank to loan an additional 10%, means that the fair market value can be determined at any business day during business hours, which basically means something sold on a national exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or gold and silver, which are also sold and it's public, what is their value? And that is necessary to determine their value, to determine what is the value of the collateral, which allows the additional loans that are secured. Um, the capital and surplus and the derivative transactions, again, as we see repeatedly, banking law is a very um, definition-based area of law. Compliance is very definition-based. And so when we get to our module on capital, we'll talk about what makes up tier one and tier two capital, but those are the best types of capital. Um, and that is really what is the measure of how you determine how much can be loaned to one borrower. So again, we're seeing why there are these very large institutions. A small institution like Abacus Bank is going to have a relatively slow um, amount that they can loan to one borrower, whereas someone like Chase has a lot of capital surplus, can loan a much higher amount. So we see again how the law encourages the large institutions. Um, one of the things that we'll see also repeatedly is this concept of attribution or essentially preventing banks and borrowers from getting around the rule by basically saying you can't just borrow um, in different names to get around the rule. If the proceeds are all going to the same purpose, they will count for the loans to one borrower. And we read a case about that, um, which is the Del Jenko case on page, uh, not what page that was. Um, but anyway, let's see, 397. Um, on, in that case, the comptroller looked at the loans, and this is what the comptroller would do during an examination. It will look at the loans and it will compare them to what the limit is. And in this case, the comptroller believed that um, the limit had been exceeded. And we see here and we read in the case that there were three loans made. One was to the president of the company, Lewis. One was made to the company itself named Fame. And one was to the treasurer. And if you were to combine these three loans, they would exceed the limit, which we're told was this 277,000. Um, of course, they were all made to different individuals. So you have to really look beyond who is the name borrower, and that's because of the attribution rule. So the question, because in this case, there was really no denying that they all went to the same purpose and that the attribution rule applied, but it was really the level of knowledge of the officers and directors and the indemnification and how that should work. And so from a compliance perspective, these types of rules are really, really important because these are the types of rules in banking law that if they're violated, offices and directors are personally liable. Um, and so really that is the gist of the issue here. And it shows you as a compliance professional, um, people take very seriously rules that can lead to their own personal liability. So it's very important.
Um, in this case, as I said, the bank and the directors, everyone acknowledged that they all knew all of these loans were going to benefit this company. Um, but the question was whether or not a checking account that was held at the bank could be used to offset and reduce the liability of the directors. Now, if you think about that, um, it doesn't really seem fair. And in fact, that's what the court said is that if there's a loan made that's legal, um, if anything, the checking account should go to offset the legal loan and that the entire value of the illegal loans should really fall upon the officers and directors. And so this case illustrates the importance of compliance with these rules and the result of lack of compliance being um, essentially personal liability. So in your book, there is a, a problem I ask you to look at among sort of the other um, questions. And I sort of, you can look at it in maybe on your own time. I don't know if we have time to go through it, but if you have questions, you can certainly reach out to me. But it, it sometimes I do find that it can help um, if you think about these rules in the abstract, they can seem, I don't know, less concrete. And if you have even a simple problem, like the one in your book, you can very figu fig quickly figure out what's 15% of 10 million. Um, then you see if something is secured by real estate, you don't get any more, you still get the 15%, but if it's under what is allowed, it's still permitted. Um, but if it exceeds your loan to one borrower amount, being secured by real estate uh, does not give you any additional authority to lend. But if it is secured um, by something like stock on the New York Stock Exchange, that will increase by 10% what the bank can lend. Um, and as well as anything that's to a joint business venture will also be subject um, to the loan to one borrower rule. So sort of on top of that are other topic that we read about was the loans to insiders. And the question I asked you to look at for this uh, particular part talked about why not prohibit or why limit it all? Um, and I think to answer that question, it's, it's to not allow insiders to have an advantage that seems unfair, but also not to discourage one from becoming an officer or director. It, in these days, because of liability and other things, it can actually be quite difficult to find individuals willing sometimes to serve in these roles. So you don't want to prohibit it, which would make it sort of a negative, but you also don't want to give someone the ability to use their insider knowledge. So essentially, the rules provide that insiders can only be made, can loans to insiders, that is, can only be made on substantially the same terms and the same kind of underwriting that are available to others. And you cannot loan to sort of a director who has bad credit if you wouldn't loan to that director if they weren't a director. Now, you can have, and you probably might be aware of this, that Oftentimes a bank may offer better terms to their employees overall. You might get a slight discount or you they waive a fee. And so if there are better terms offered to you know, the regular employees, those can be made also to the insiders. You just don't want those in power to get an advantage that is not given to the everyday individuals. Um, in addition, the individual, the loan to one borrow rules always apply. Sometimes these directors are high flyers, wealthy people who want large loans. Um, and so they are still subject to the loan to one borrower. And there is actually another rule that aggregates all the loans to insiders and they cannot exceed the capital and unimpaired surplus. And so you see, again, you want to protect the bank from those at the top using the bank for their own personal sort of use and getting loans that maybe they couldn't get in the regular market. Insiders, and we'll see the definition in a moment, is sort of the top folks, but the executives are even higher at a higher level, really the key decision makers. Um, and so there are some special rules for the executives and Interestingly, there is um, the ability to make a loan in any amount to finance the education of an executive's children 
or the actual residence of the executive. So I guess these executives must send their children to very expensive schools and or buy very expensive homes. But one of the things to be aware of is that if your bank that you're working for is going to make one of these loans, they have to be reported to the board of directors. And these are, the, again, the types of requirements that compliance professionals are responsible for. They have to be, you have to demonstrate how they're permitted under the general loan to insiders. Um, and you also have to provide the board with financial information on the executive officer. So I suppose if one were an executive, they may think twice. If they get this loan, they will have to disclose a lot of financial information to their peers. Um, but again, these are the types of requirements that com compliance professionals will do the real legwork for. To give you an idea of an insider versus an executive, an insider is an officer, director, or principal shareholder or any related interest. An executive is one who really participates in policy making. Things like the president, the vice president, and some of these like cashier, secretary, treasurer really depends on how a bank is operated. And sometimes a treasurer is a very sort of bookkeeping type role. Sometimes it's a very policy making role. And a related interest is a company of a person or a political campaign. Um, so you see that the bank regulators are really looking hard um, at where the loans are going. We saw that in the, the case that we already read and talked about. And then our final case for this module, where we see an individual who made 14 loans and he seemed to have every friend and relative involved in this. Um, but this is something that the bank regulators take very carefully and they will look beyond the documentation. And so in this case, uh, they did look and they did determine that all of these loans uh, were for this individual's benefit. And because this individual had gone to such an elaborate amount of work to put different individuals' names on these different loans, they ultimately uh, determined that the right punishment was to remove him as a director um, and also to permanently ban him from banking. And so he challenged this, but ultimately the FDIC was upheld. Toward the end of uh, this semester, one of the last modules, we will talk about various powers that the regulators have. And one of the very most severe is this removal. And so in this case, the FDIC um, interpretation was upheld and the individual was permanently banned from banking. And so that is one of the penalties that can be opposed against an individual. So as I had talked about, sort of at the front end with the, um, the chartering, they really look at the integrity of individuals. And if that integrity and that those actions during the time that a person's involved with a bank show personal dealing that harms the bank, the bank regulators will permanently ban an individual from the business of banking. So that is a, one of the more severe penalties that we see imposed, but on a semi-regular basis. So this is sort of just a, a brief kind of overview of some key regulations that impact assets. And in our next module, we will talk about liabilities and the liability, as we'll see, is oftentimes a deposit, which will then lead into the next module, which is the deposit insurance, a key aspect of bank regulation. So please feel free to reach out with any questions and thank you for listening.